What's up, dudes? Welcome. Anyone who's here, you know, in earnest and not just fucking try to find a why to dismiss me and act like I'm fucking, like I'm the one who don't know what they're talking about when they encounter me. Gotta understand, a lot of people are like, anyway, before I go again, I'm just still resonating from my, like, fucking irritated by like minus 60 karma for speaking on reddit because a bunch of people don't like to have sh people don't like that fucking truth pointed out to them that's the truth oh you don't like that either that's the fucking truth they, li they literally don't like having truths pointed out to them so they'll find any fucking hole in me as a being me as a person any word i said that was slightly skewed any word i didn't say because it's a fucking world of infinite detail and we're having a conversation with little paragraphs and, uh, and this world is like oh we all speak in four letters at a time it's like emotes like, where, what fucking world are we in anymore? Or where our f communication, when we need to communicate large amounts of information at once to fucking correct our stupidity? Really? Sorry, not sorry, dudes. It's a matter of just fucking slapping the scientific community around. You guys are a little off. Fucking arrogance. I'll be the arrogant one around here. I found the theory of everything. You just fucking listen so to some regurgitated bullshit. Maybe you did some shit. <laughs> noobs. It's just noobs. It's not. I shouldn't be angry about it. That's just. I'm advance consciously sorry not fucking sorry some people are like you know vibratorily with the resonance of society's like baseline you know where we're all kind of like held to a baseline you know like <laughs> floating with the I can't help it I can't fucking help it so then they encounter me thinking they fucking know up. We all agree here at the baseline. And then my book. Like, that's a. I'm not. I'm not book. My book is a good example of how fucking ridiculous this world is. Let me show you. Downloads. Probably down here somewhere. There it is. Probably, let's just do that one. My book. La la la. Let's scroll down. Oh, the book. Okay. Wait for it. Up oh, the scripture quotations. You know, like is legally mandated by these so-called Bibles. Like. You know, you guys didn't even write it. Like, how can you fucking mandate copyright? This is bullshit. Like, that they did this, that they can do this, where I felt obligated. So now, so now, because I felt obligated, I knew this. I knew some fucking cunt ass would come along. Oh, well, okay, then I'll consider your fucking obviously wrong interpretation because you're telling me shit that I don't know. Uh, let's see, let's see. Oh, 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 oh. there it is. Knew it. <laughs> wrong. Let me go tell you why you're wrong. <laughs> Look at me being a dumbass. <laughs> Did I mention I don't know what I'm talking about? Literally don't know. They're like anyone who, anyone who uses scripture. I'm like, dude. See, you don't know I was fucking atheist. I found the theory of everything, and then I read scripture. Uh, you don't know that because you're fucking not up to date, dudes. You're missing some details because people aren't telling you they aren't letting you know what's going on that the fucking truth has been found. They're like, oh, maybe not. Oh, uh, oh, uh, maybe not. Uh, uh. 
What do you mean? Fucking afraid. Because it's, it's, I'm encroaching on people's territories. I'm not, by choice, it's not my fault. People think shit that's not true. Think it through, maybe. I know that there's a lot of indoctrination going on here. Oh, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, there's a... Uh, <clears throat> it's just anyway i'm so sorry five minutes in that's good let's get back to what i was doing before i got irritated by communicating with people or close-minded it's like fucking throwing pearl be before swine there's fucking noobs literally too closed minded, too uneducated, no offense, in thinking outside of the box. Like, literally thinking so inside the box they can't fucking see alternatives. They don't even know the alternatives exist, but they literally are okay with that. And then when they experience there's alternatives, guess what? Those alternatives are shit. Nope. Even though it's obvious the alternatives arose in a world where the fucking bullshit that is shit is the dominant view so you know they should be aware of that the odds are i mean obviously not every single proposer is like i'm well acquainted with plate tectonics and then they come up with some other bullshit but i am quite studied noobs that's why I can sit here and go, noobs. <laughs> bring it. And not some physical shit like some bitch. Bring it. Bring your fucking A game, noobs. <laughs> Sorry. Back to the people who are actually listening to me and who have made it through that rump, bumpy terrain uh, of whatever that was. Outburst. I was just thinking I would like to, maybe this might be a good one to look at. Like people who agree with the consensus, they aren't going around watching shit like this. They aren't fucking researching, <laughs> maybe casually, maybe they think they are. They don't know. They literally don't have a comparison of me to realize that they're not researching. They're casual. <laughs> Thank you. And then, and then I talk to them and they just get to act all fucking right because it's a consensus. It's so easy. It's easy mode. <laughs> Thank you and thanks for coming and my apology for being late. It doesn't mean it's true mode. I took the wrong turn after getting my coffee, and uh, so so much for being a geologist, right? But I ran out of bad lands, and said, okay, I'm in the wrong way here. Oh, uh, sorry, buddy. I've been throwing some fucking anger at geologists, kind of, kind of just some widespread uh, collateral damage, probably kind of methods. Not maybe not appropriate. It's quite not exact. That's part of the problem. Is I'm not exact, so maybe I do have kind of a collateral damage attacking response when I feel like lashing out is what's coming out of me. It's not my fucking fault that I'm trying to share information and people aren't listening. I get fucking fed up at times. I'm a human being. And a god. What? I'll say it. Bitches. Here, so. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, yes, my colleague uh, Steve Drysby's big party. <laughs> sorry, 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 guys. <laughs> I'm just real pissed. I'm honestly, it's literally like it happened last night. I can't even talk. I literally can't talk. Like I could continue to have a conversation on Reddit, but every time I post, I just give another post that everyone can dogpile. Dislike, dislike, dislike. It's, like you guys are fucking assholes. Pardon my formality. You fucking assholes. Casual assholes, too. Like, fucking, oh, this post I disagree with. I'll just casually do 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 do. <laughs> Rather than actually listening. And then they, like, finally someone explains, uh, in the, explains what I'm trying to say, but from a 
not what I'm trying to say because they don't, what I mentioned, expanding Earth. A geologist provides an actual tangible expanding Earth d description that's like kind of captures what happened not really because they don't fucking know what they're talking about that's a problem they don't know what they're talking about even the people who know about the expanding earth like accept that it's not true they're not really fucking considering it dudes they're not thinking it through they're just like oh it's been disproven and here's the like two reasons that i know of of why like the like just i literally said oh it's been measured it's been measured to not be expanding and that's because it's not really expanding right now and it's because the earth is a fucking supernova and i've went into detail about that but it doesn't matter that dude doesn't fucking care what i have to say it wasn't even in, in his relationship it was he was just replying he might not have even seen that he just goes ahead though anyway here here's what happened expanding earth and also it, it's been disproven because the earth is not actually growing in radius anymore now that's besides the point that i explained any more already because i had detail of how it was a supernova but you know people don't like the truth they like to live in their echo chambers where they don't know what they're talking about part of it he's a geologist uh i did okay steve and steve i'm steve so let's hang out guys oh my god geological survey of canada and steve and i ever since uh 1999, we've been going up north to address the issue of the Permian Triassic boundary. Uh, it's been a very, very fruitful uh, a collaboration. We've been uh. no. Let's see. Oh, I got plus one somehow. I literally got plus one somehow. It was 68. I guess someone wanted my karma to be 69. Uh, I called him. This person thinks that they're not behaving in a social credit score method by having a karma f structure in Reddit. <laughs> See, this is why this world's fucking like just short-sighted. So confident, so wrong. <laughs> okay, okay, bring it. Bring it, dude. See, see how they just literally... Let's see what this dude's responding to. Bucko. Look at this. So confident, so wrong. I literally minus 32. Based on what evidence? Oh, and then he, I'm pretty sure he said he might have edited that. I'm not. No, he didn't. No. He would have said edited. I literally provide evidence. And then, of course, it's not sufficient. People. People, I, but I provide, I answer a fucking question and minus 32. You guys are fucking noobs. It's as simple as that. So confident, so wrong. Yeah, dude, you guys. I'm just a mirror for you noobs. I bring the fucking noobs out. They fucking reflect. What do you want from me? That's me. I'm a little bit of a big system. I move through things and cause ruckus. It's just how it goes. What do you want from me? People who say ironically, say it's all connected, uh, unironically, you mean because you don't know what you're talking about because it's fucking true, dude. So, this, is, this is a fucking shit. Shouldn't be taken seriously by anyone about anything. The, the fucking ignorance of people, dude. Anyway, let's move on. That's why I'm pissed, dude. Minus 13. Like, I literally answered this person kindly. No, no tone of voice. Minus 13. Fuck you, noobs. You're just fucking noobs. I'm just gonna be blunt. You guys need to realize you don't know what you're fucking talking about, geologists. The ones who are not actually... Who encounter me and sit there and be all fucking arrogant and don't actually allow the transmission of information and act like you're fucking scientists. Noobs. Publish eight papers on the topic. Or uh, act like you fucking are a, a member of the Church of Science. Like, you don't even fucking practice it. You fucking noobs. And we have two uh, being reviewed. You just reviewed. fucking got a bias that you just sit there and enjoy the presence of now that you've reached an equilibrium. Oh, I accept plate tectonics. Now I'm going to go about my life with my bias. 
because you're fucking noobs. And, and uh, some uh, pretty major publications here, two of which are uh, just out uh, in geology this, uh, this very month. So uh, very exciting stuff that we've been able to, uh, to put together. So my talk here is about uh, the, uh, the greatest mass extinction in Earth history. Like you fucking noob ass fucking belief systems. Oh, 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 oh shit, gonna fucking <laughs> boom. Where'd they go? You certainly know about dinosaurs in this place here. There's great experts in this uh, organization. This very fine museum about how. I'm they sorry. Were you talking? Were you talking? That's what's gonna happen. It's gonna be, were you talking? Just everyone just shuts the fuck up because. 95% of the belief systems on Earth have just been shattered by their fucking new mass. The dinosaurs evolved and became extinct. Pardon me, I'm gonna talk <laughs> Pardon me, guys. I know I'm a little, I'm a little fucking collateral damage -y here right now. Pardon me. I love you. About something that happened 252 million years ago as opposed to 65 million years ago. Uh, I'll talk uh, first about the Arctic record of the Permian Triassic boundary and how we had to part with an old dogma in order to be able to move forward with our research. Uh, then I'll talk about a long yep. lead-up time. In yep, time to part with that again, dude. Tens of millions of years prior to the extinction, and uh, more specifically work we've done uh, putting a, um, a certain, you know, concept of anoxia and ocean acidification forward. And then we'll talk about the catastrophe itself, which is uh, related to the Siberian traps eruption. We'll talk about that and global warming. And then the aftermath. Uh, and I will show you how several attempts to, to recover the biological system uh, were aborted. And I'll tell you why. And then we'll reach some conclusions. So uh, should be uh, able to go through that in, a, in about 40, 45 minutes. So the greatest mass extinction on Earth. They cleared right? the top and, uh, about 30 You know minutes. that one, right? And uh, you know the <laughs> dinosaur vanished. And you know the consensus the revolves pretty much out of the around the oxygen needed to keep the thing afloat. Right. OK, so the Himalayas. A bolide, uh, meteorite uh, hitting planet Earth in an area, this is now a Yucatan Peninsula, uh, uh, and... Literally not true. And, and mayhem, mayhem just uh, followed suit and, and killed all these... No offense, but literally not true. I don't, I don't want to offend people who aren't, haven't, like, interact with, with me. And that's the thing. When people who I have interacted with are being fucking noobs... And I speak out, and the other people I haven't interacted with who would have been noobs but hadn't yet, I already pushed them away. And people who wouldn't have been, maybe I skew them a little bit further into the direction of being a little uh, resistant to allowing me to speak kind of thing, which maybe not the best approach, but honesty is the best policy. Noobs. Magnificent reptiles. So you know all about that here. Probably uh, one uh, I do uh, you probably also know that there's our five <laughs> big extinction in Earth history. In this diagram here, you've got extinction. In I'm using a derogatory term that's not like historically used in, in any way. Like that's so uh, maybe it's a little less derogatory because it's like a it it literally also is like what did he say because <laughs> because are you, oh yeah because you're a noob that's why that's why <laughs> intensity in person and then millions of years so we're here zero and we go all the way down to the base cambrian here and there's, there's five big ones uh, and uh, of those five i'll decide to call people noobs just because they don't know the term noobs meaning new to something you know noobs of course, you have uh, the end Cretaceous here, right there. But the biggest of them all, the granddaddy of them all, is the end Permian right here. And you can see all it peaks here. This blue uh, column goes uh, to, through the sky, essentially. Um, now, no matter how you put it, whether you count the number of families or the number of genera, this is by far the largest mass extinction on Earth. Uh, numbers uh, that have been thrown are around at 90 to 95 percent of uh, at least uh, calcite or, or carbonate, calcium carbonate secreting organisms vanish. Strongly suggestive of the, the particulars of the Earth's expanding process during 
during the supernova where it it basically emitted some particles and then uh, th through the process what it was emitting was transforming kind of like how there's like shallograms and then there's ammonites and then there's coral reefs like different materials limestone and whatever else finished uh, rather rapidly uh, and also a lot of the non calcareous life forms as well because following the uh, the extinction itself there's just very very little in terms of any evidence of soft or hard uh, bodies so it's a massive massive uh, catastrophe that affected planet earth and in fact which pretty much reset the evolutionary clock of our planet and then after that it was a lot more origination of species and genera and families leading to where we are right now now what uh, caused the permian triassic extinction uh, is a is a is a cause of debate and there's really I done did solved it you're welcome really no uh, kill mechanism and this one is not it i mean it's been proposed by some people in in australia based on very uh, 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 sketchy evidence that have been proven wrong uh, that uh, bolide that hit the earth, but there's just... I'm very curious what their evidence is, if it's out in the sea, or if it's in, uh, like, the... <sighs> I don't know. No crater, no, none of the geochemical anomalies we associate with, with such a thing in uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, the Cretaceous, at the end of the Cretaceous. So this is one reason why my colleague Steve Bradley and I went to the Arctic uh, to actually see what was uh, there in terms of the permian triassic boundary because you knew they were we had permian rocks we knew we had triassic literally, rocks literally literally over top it to the arctic so it came this way presumably to the siberian traps presumably so kind of over here so it's pretty much over i mean the odds are he was totally over it so maybe they maybe they looked at i would like to see any studies here the thing is like this is not considered an impact crater at this point but it's obviously the same type of feature whether it's caused by a extraterrestrial impact or not irrelevant it's obviously one of them so i'd be very curious to see and we, we felt that it should be a good permian triassic boundary section at least one here. and we as you will see you guys ready to part with that old dogma? We found a lot more than one. But in, uh, in order to do that, we had to part from an, with an old dogma. Now, as uh, Francois said, I worked for 18 years with a geological survey of Canada and Calgary. Great place to work. They, they funded my research, my PhD, and all of this over the years. I cannot be more grateful. But when I got there, there were giants. You know, when you say we stand on the shoulders of giants, and nothing can be more true than with the geological survey of Canada. Especially when you go that far north. This This is the area I will be talking about here. It's called the Zverdra Basin. It's a, it's a huge sedimentary basin in the northern part of Canada. It's a petroleum-rich province. It's been drilled in the 60s and 70s, early 80s. Oil and gas fields have been discovered. But more importantly, there's beautiful mountains in the east here that allows us to see the stratigraphic succession uh, in an environment where there's no vegetation. So it's a, pretty much a geological paradise. Uh, of course, we got there with Twin Otter. Uh, this is Ken Borek. Twin Otter, uh, very much like the one that crashed in Antarctica. What the? But that's not... This is, the Siberian traps are like over here. So that that's a good sign, though, that the... Um, so he's saying over here that this here because it we pretty much say the siberian traps are here but they're caused by a particle that was huge right here so it must have had like a significant enough influence over here in this region somewhere and this probably maybe even opened up so this might have been directly adjacent ish like kind of here so maybe there's some signs there of the energy flows 
and the, the supernova. The east here, that allows us to see the stratigraphic succession. Because that's what happened is the particle, there, there's literally a particle under, there's particles, like here's a hexagon. I know, I'm just jumping into it. You gotta look at my other research otherwise. Here's a hexagon that's, that's here, comes up to here, comes over here, comes over here. It's also visible. Like this boundary. This one's one too. Basically a big polygon. This one's a big polygon. This is a big polygon. And underneath the polygon exist particles that are larger and basically at some point large enough to support the whole polygon. And effectively, then that polygon is like the like the um, galactic disk of that particle, in a way, or at least a part of it is. Maybe some of it is like cons would be considered outside of the the galaxy of that particle's galaxy, but. Uh, what was I doing? Oh yeah, related rock formations, like, like this, polygons, and with polygons made of polygons, like that's kind of like a big, bigger polygon of polygons, or like this one, or here, like there's several polygons like that. That's how it is, just bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it's literally Earth-sized, continent-sized. And then this is how they are underneath particles like this. Like this, if we could look, if we could get under the surface of the Earth and look up at the layers that, where there's like voids underneath the layers, at some point we would see structures like this. Maybe not exactly because of the size, but generally speaking, this type of structure is what's occurring where there's a physical particle that's larger than the other surrounding physical particles. That's kind of like the nucleus that then supports like a core's, uh, like the, the layer above it of crust supporting, supported on it by this <clears throat> and below it really like the pressure from below any any upward pressures are also supported by this because it's it's more like a shallogram between layers like damador coon like this place it's more like this Okay. Let me carry on. No. Uh, in an environment where there's no vegetation. So it's a, pretty much a geological paradise. Um, <laughs> of course, we get there with Twin Otter. Uh, this is Ken Borek, Twin Otter, uh, very much like the one that crashed in Antarctica a couple of weeks ago. This world is just fucking unfair. You can't speak into it unless you're in the fucking consensus. It's like a witch hunt at that point. Bunch of fucking unfortunately and uh, we certainly know these pilots very well they are amazing pilots they can land any i'm just going to straight talk about it to describe it to people so that people can also understand it and see it ones who are like all right i know this dude's fucking maybe not my cup of tea in some ways but like <laughs> he is fucking speaking truth <clears throat> i can acknowledge it because it's fucking true it's not complicated it's true it's true anywhere on half deflated balloon tires on the tundra uphill downhill it's absolutely amazing what they can do and they set us on in the middle of nowhere and then of course with teams of students uh, we get a helicopter there and we sling our stuff set up camp in absolutely pristine and remarkable places to do geology this is oh one of our God. student here kitchen tent there private quarters my tent here and uh, 
It's called snoring distance, you know. <laughs> snoring distance. <laughs> Fucking fortunate. I guess someday I'll be able to do shit like this and I can then therefore be like, okay, I'm fortunate too in those ways. But right now I feel a little like hands tied when the system just, it's, a, it's just fun stuff. Just fun stuff. Here's all the funding and then <laughs> it's almost like a... It really like a childish thing which is not it's not a problem it just is like a support structure that's so like extensive it's kind of it's like kids that's all it's like it's i guess it is pretty much a school but <laughs> and the, the students uh decide that not me so it just makes me sad that i cannot do things like this but it, <sighs> I look forward to when India, people of India, are like, you know that guy? I know the rest of the world thinks he's a fucking idiot. But, uh, you know, in spite of us also kind of not liking his his personality, we do think he's uh, killing it with some shit about India. And we are actually really, you know, it'd be, it, we'd be hard-pressed not to invite him to look at our country closely. <laughs> Anyway, we do a lot of walking, as you can see, and so you have to be in pretty good shape uh, to be there. And uh, we walk and we wade rivers and we, we reach these beautiful outcrops, often polished by retreating glaciers and all of it. As I said, this is geological paradise uh, where permanent Triassic rocks are superbly exposed. So sometimes you run into uh, uh, friendly animals. Hmm. Uh, this is Perry Caribou, of course. Uh, we also carry a gun in case we meet a, a big white furry thing, but uh, in 30 years I haven't seen a single polar bear, nor tracks, nor, nor uh, turds, nor nothing. So I've been pretty lucky. Uh, so students are keen, and, uh, but just like anybody else, they have to stop uh, for lunch and, and grab samples. But essentially the geology we do is the same that my former colleagues of the Geological Survey of Canada were doing 40 or 50 years ago. You take notes, you collect samples, you look for fossils, ages, and all of that. The technology has not changed. Uh, the science has not changed. We, we, now we use GPS, we know exactly where we are, we have satellite phones and all of this, but it doesn't change anything to the geology. 50 years er earlier, um, you know, these uh, people didn't have a team of 12 or 13 grad students like I do. Uh, they were uh, actually two giants of the Canadian geoscience, Ray Thor Steinson, who unfortunately passed away earlier this year, and Tim Tozer, who passed away a few years ago. Uh, alone, these two guys pretty much mapped the entire Arctic and define the stratigraphy in a basin that was not even known to be there. Like, they literally defined this word of basin. It's amazing what they did, the amount of work they did. They would go there for six months in dog sleds and canoe, and the, uh, the most amazing wind. Basin, for sure, is a significant word in terms of, like, it's an indicator of where a polygon is. To, to, uh, to winter conditions, essentially, away from their family and everything, but they were passionate geologists, and the, their contribution to Canadian science is absolutely mind-boggling. It's like a cop. Um, both became, of course, members of the, or, or, of the Order of Canada and, and were, uh, were celebrated as a tremendous scientists, as it should. But one thing they, they did, this is a stratigraphic column here, Carboniferous and Permian, you got a Triassic here, and, and Thor Steinson, Ray Thor Steinson, recognized that there were five major stratigraphic sequences. And you can see those, those gaps in time, right? These vertical lines tell you there was a gap in time. At least that was the interpretation. And uh, so we look at this area here. This is the, the transition from Permian to Triassic. So, and the, the belief was that the entire uh, late Triassic was missing. I, I mean, late Permian, sorry. And part of the middle Permian was missing. Uh, as much as 15 million years worth of time was missing there, according to them, based on ammonoid fauna, right? Or the lack of ammonoid fauna, I shall say. And in the central part of the basin, it was even more, 20 million years. 20 million years is a lot of time. And, uh, and because of that, these people and, and successive uh, generations... I mean, given the way that the explosive force was emitted here by this particle, I know it's hard to see. Here's Russia... The energy came through here, 
hit here basically when the earth expanded and was fracturing apart the energy propagating between the, the polygons of the earth's crust which was causing polygonal bends in the and fault and breaks in the faults in the crust because it was following the polygonal outlines and when it reached here it then spirals into this particle and it becomes absorbed so it's like exciting the particle and the particle becomes excited and it's supernovas <clears throat> and then that supernova because there's crust on top of it it's underneath the surface it's not just like hanging out it's deep within the, the earth and so it physically was essentially rather than going upward it went sideways through the paths of the least resistance because there was just like empty space relatively of less dense material at the least that this could travel through over here where it appears like it's harder to go up through the layers than to go sideways through the layers which makes sense generally speaking although it does seem like it would be easier just to go straight up than to go sideways forever but it's actually it comes sideways forever a supernova reminiscent of my research like i'm hanging out and then suddenly this inflow of energy causing supernova theory of everything discovery boom a head pop, but then it just creates this crater the energy flows stay under the surface and start propagating into society under the surface because people aren't willing to admit that the theory of everything was found and then all the subsequent discoveries that happened, uh, it's just, oh my god, dudes, good luck. Good luck not admitting faults after encountering me. Except for out of just denial. Particle explodes, and then it breaks through this boundary, and and comes down this way down this channel over this way and this channel so it's separated at this bend here which is probably I would say like this type of feature isn't just here like I think there's one over in here at least I would say maybe this one might have been also caused by like a flow that was some reason separated at it. I don't know. There are other features like this around, I believe, more. Although I might be... I can't think of them off the top of my head, but it's not even visible on the surface, really. But here it's very visible. There, for sure, it's, these things occur on small scales where I could point to them if I could find them on small scales of like water flowing, which is really a good representation of what this seems to be, almost like a river that separated and went this way, shoved debris into this polygon. This polygon here got literally physically filled with the energy coming in that way filled the polygon made it made it more dense and then it came this way also producing the himalayas so like it would kind of make sense that when some shit was going down like the supernova of that particle like because the energy was generally propagating this way the explosive force in that direction was actually kind of funneled more in the sideways directions so some of it maybe went over here but it looks like this object which maybe was this uh, island was maybe formed even in part by the process or shaped by it for sure because it has that same kind of bend and where suddenly it bend wraps around this way 
do, and it points right in to this opening where the flow went through because it probably was shaped by it. Oh. <laughs> so he's talking about over here, somewhere, maybe here, maybe here, I don't know, somewhere over here. And saying that there's no evidence of the like in a in a play tectonics world, this makes literally no sense. Where are the layers, dude? Just gonna say they fucking don't exist. <sighs> it makes no fucking sense. It's gonna sit there and say that it's twenty million years of deposition, layer, 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 in a, in general sense, and yet there just happen to be places where there's just no fucking record whatsoever of that time in history. That time, not that place, that time, dude. No supernova of a particle under the earth that radiates debris in a direction that we misinterpret the time frame of. Uh, yeah, that could do that because it would fucking send over here time is passing while this debris is flying this way and this just wouldn't necessarily produce like a a record over here let's see what else they got they say because i'm obviously just touching this just generation of uh, geologists at the survey thought that there's no sense studying the Permian-Triassic boundary in the Arctic. It's just not there. Well, these guys had even stronger opinions. This is uh, the famous uh, Tim Tozer, who you can call the father of Triassic uh, ammonoid stratigraphy in the world. The available evidence suggests that the boundary between marine rocks of Permian and Triassic age invariably marks a hiatus, not only in Canada, but throughout the world. A period of time unrepresented by strata evidently falls within the Permian, not the Triassic. We are left without any sections that clearly provide a transition in the marine facies between the Permian and the Triassic. Yeah, that's because it fucking supernova to under the surface over here in this corner, practically. And really didn't have this, the effect that of, of coating the surface that other things add like the flood well celebrated as such tim had a very strong opinion based on what he could see in permian and triassic ammonoids uh, that uh, the evidence suggests that the boundary between marine rocks permian triassic age and vibrant marks or hiatus that means a gap not only in canada but throughout the world he thought that throughout the world there was a big big gap that there was nowhere uh, late permian or latest permian rocks to be seen that's quite a statement. And then it was saying a bit further, the period of, of time unrepresented by strata could evidently fall within the Permian, not the Triassic. So Tozer became very famous because he set the four stages or sub-stages of the early Triassic in the, the Canadian Arctic. They, they're called Grisbachian, Denierian, Smithian, and Spatian. And they were defined by Tim Tozer. And they're still used to this day as the standard of Triassic time. And here's his final statement here. We are left without any section that clearly provide a transition to marine. What did I just do? We are left without any sections that clearly provide. No. Major fossil groups. So there is there really not a geological record? Is that what's going on? Fission between the Permian and the Triassic. That was like a, a weird gap in a lot of places on the Earth in this time frame because the Earth was expanding, but the expansion process happened to be focused within the Earth at that time. Tozer's view in 1967, and I might add it was probably his view by the time he died a couple of years ago. 
Unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, a lot of people uh, took that as a challenge to find those continuous sections uh, around the world, and they did find them. Uh, over the, the following 40 to 50 years, all around the world, they found uh, succession that were uh, with no evidence of a major gap between the Permian and the Triassic. Well, fortunately, uh, a lot of people uh, took that as a challenge to find those continuous sections uh, around the world, and they did find them uh, over the... And, uh, so it really is a global like, subtlety. Maybe it's not unobservable, non-existent, but it's subtle. The following 40 to 50 years, all around the world, they found uh, succession that were... China. Uh, with no evidence of a major gap between the Permian and the Triassic. And some of the best actually were right there in Meishan, South China, um, which was more near the Paleo Equator at the time. This is our Zrega Basin there at the time, 250 million, uh, 2 million years ago at the time of the Permian Triassic extinction. And there they found in one bed, you know, the, the proper fossils. And those fossils are called conodonts. Conodonts are, uh, were worm-like animals, little worms that sent, you know, flo uh, swimming in the, in the ocean. Nibs. No offense. <laughs> Cono don't, don't call everyone noobs. Maybe that's not the best approach. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know, at times it just has to be said. And what is preserved is actually... It just has to be said. Uh, well, you'll get past it. Uh, the teeth of these animals, and this is the part of the, the jaw, or the teeth of one of these tiny little worms. And, and these things have evolved dramatically across the Permian and Triassic boundary. And uh, there's one species called Eindiotis parvus, which has, is recognized now as the marker of the base Triassic around the world. So this is Meishan, China, where the, what? Across the boundary, yeah. These are, it's a supernova. It's literally like shards that are probably getting shaped by heat in ways that we don't understand. It's like literally. We call the global stratotype. That penetrate through because of the heat, just fucking, and the pressure. And a uh, line and point is in the rocks here. There's a big team park and everything there. You can, unbelievable. The Chinese put a lot and a lot of money to put their finger on that boundary, and they got it right, I might add. Uh, one thing, though, it, the mass extinction here, you can see here, get this red arrow, is not at the Permian Triassic boundary. It's sl slightly a bit lower, and it doesn't seem like a few, uh, just a few centimeters here, but that few centimeters is as much as, uh, as uh, 100,000, maybe up to 600,000 years. So this is very, very condensed here in this succession. But the mass extinction is within the late Permian, so now we talk about the latest Permian extinction, or the end. I mean, that's not completely anything. A little before the, little before the actual events, Maybe it's because it blew its top. That's that's all I can think of uh, on top of my head. It was blowing its top initially in this phase, and then it blew its top. Permian extinction as opposed to the Permian Triassic extinction. So something to remember, the extinction is high in the Permian, the Permian Triassic boundary is somewhere higher. All right, so let's go to the Zverdor Basin. This is what we did, Steve Grasby and I, in 1999. We said, listen, you know, everywhere around the world, these Permian Triassic continuous sections are popping, and we're still sitting in our office in Calgary being told by our, by our masters that don't even bother, we don't have it. Uh, and Steve and I just couldn't take that as, a, as an answer. This is what young people do, you challenge your masters, right? And I, I always encourage my students to do that with my own stuff. Well, that's what I did with the stuff of, of Thor Steinson and Tozer and Nazichuk. And I said, listen, that basin is a big sag basin, it's a big gaping hole there, you can see that. This is slope and basinal facies surrounded by a shallow water carbonate shelf system. So that's, that's like carbonate shelf 
and, and surrounding, you know, a deep water hole. Not as deep as the modern ocean, but probably now we know about one or two kilometers deep. So surely you must have in this area somewhere a continuous section across the Permian-Triassic boundary. It just makes no sense that the whole, whole basin was emptied of its water, you know, a thousand meters, maybe more worth of water at the end of the Permian. It makes no sense whatsoever, but we had to prove it, so we went to prove that. And uh, when the first uh, place to prove it was in seismic profile. That's the first thing we did. That it so let's go to the Zverdra Basin. This is what we did, Steve Grasby and I, in 1999. We said, listen, you know, everywhere around the world, these permian triassic continuous sections are popping. And we're still sitting in our office in Calgary being told by our, by our masters that don't even bother. We don't have it. Uh, and Steve and I just couldn't take that as, a, as an answer. This is what young people do. You challenge your masters, right? And I, I always encourage my students to do that with my own stuff. Well, uh, unless it's me, and then I'm not allowed to because people are too challenged by my challenging. They like a playful challenge, not an actually persuasive challenge where they, they have to, like, <clears throat> step down in some way and be like, oh, pardon me, please, after you. That's what I did with the stuff of, of Thor Steinson and Tozer and Nazichuk. And I said, listen, that basin is a big sag basin. It's a big gaping hole there. You can see that. This is slope and basinal facies surrounded by a shallow water carbonate shelf system. So that's, that's like carbonate shelf and, and surrounding, you know, a deep water hole. Not as deep as the modern ocean, but probably now we know about one or two kilometers deep. Like so poly, huh? surely you must have in this area somewhere a continuous section across the Permian-Triassic boundary. Mud, it just makes no sense that the whole, whole basin was emptied of its water. A carbonate shell to a mud uh, polyon. Maybe maybe a sandstone shell like the or um, border like the. Is based on this. It's like a big rock. It's a big rock. Big, like here's a grain. Here's a grain. Here's the matrix. You know, a thousand meters, maybe more worth of water at the end of the permit. Makes no sense whatsoever. But we had to prove it, so we went to prove that. And uh, when the first uh, place to prove it was in seismic profile. That's the first thing we did. The industry had, had shot some seismic in the western Arctic, the uh, Sabine Peninsula and Melville Island. And here, they, so you can see these, these railroad tracks here. Uh, they're, they're good carbonates, and they're middle permanent carbonates. So this is where the last fossils, good recognizable fossils that you could date, were found in this river. I don't know what this is. 200-something, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, 300. They're based on their ammonoids, they're, they're brachiopods. 200, 800, 800. You know, they're, they're, they're good fossils. But then we were able to prove that you could follow these reflectors, right? And there's actually a very thick late Permian wedge of chert, that silicious sediment, uh, right you know, between those last be uh, dated beds and the Permian Triassic boundary. We're talking as much as a one kilometer of strata here on this seismic profile. And uh, then when I did my PhD in the uh, mid 80s, I found exactly the same thing. Uh, in, in southwest Ellesmere Island. You can see here the Permian Triassic boundary is that very sharp contact here. This is a blind fjord formation. This is all chert here. And here's the last carbonate, just like we saw on seismic profile. The last carbonates with dated fossils, and they disappear. You know, the carbonate just shale out into a deep water shale, you know, a siltstone. So this is deep water. It shallows up here. But there's another sequence right on top here. This is good, clean, shallow water. Speculitic chert and spicules. I'll show you what a spicule is. It's actually a remnant of a silicious sponge. And then we trace these beds laterally into deeper water. And sure enough, we found some equivalent chert, but this time darker, deeper water. But sure enough, this is the Permian Triassic boundary right there. It's the same sequence was there. And we went that way deeper and deeper and deeper and got more and more and more of that succession. So surely it was there. So in the, uh, one of our recent, well, the first contribution with Steve and I came out with was to put all the stratigraphy together and we therefore came up with two different names, new names, to account for that upper permanent sequence that had been 
ignored by our uh, previous uh, 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 scientists, right? So the Lindstrom formation, that's the... Just wait till... White shirt going into the black stripe formation, that's the black shirt and shell. And uh, we got the fossils as well, again, conodonts with Charles Henderson of the University of Calgary. Uh, we, we, we sample like crazy. And, and now, we're not talking about an environment that's as productive as Meishan, but still, some of the key conodonts are there. Uh, we, we did find a few uh, in the late Permian there that are characteristic. And we found certainly the early Triassic one, including our friend Hindiotis parvus, which is the global marker for the base Triassic, right? And uh, so we put that together, and then we, we, we put the, that in a sequence stratigraphic framework, which means the, the, the packages of rocks between those unconformities. And we realize, uh, studying this in great detail uh, with Steve Grasby, we, we cross section again from the from the, uh, the shallow stuff to the deep water stuff, what Steve and I did after that, just to prove it, you know, we were totally convinced it was continuous, but just to prove it, we used stable isotopes across all these sections here to try to prove uh, that it was continuous sedimentation. So we look at this area here. This is a type section of the Lindstrom Formation at Lindstrom Creek. So, so you can see the white rocks here is very resistant, yucky looking. It's all church. It's, this thing will rip your boot uh, to shred. They're, they're absolutely full of sponge spicules. Uh, in, in, in outcrop, this is a finger here, a dirty finger. Uh, you can see these cross beds here. These are what we call hummocky cross stratified structure. They represent storm deposits. In other words, this is a proof that it was very shallow water, not, not deep water for that church. Storm. <laughs> I bet there was a storm. And then this is what, what the thin section will show. This is what you see under a microscope. You've got little sticks, you know, and these are sponge spicules. I don't have a scale here, but one little stick like this might be half a millimeter long, and you can see how thin they are. But extremely well preserved. You see the internal canals, they're all siliceous. It is pure SiO2, like quartz, but uh, it's actually calcite in a different form of quartz. But that's pretty much all you have in this entire late permian deposit. In other words, this is a proof that it was very shallow and water. Are these fossils? Not, not deep water for that. considered fossils. Chert. And then this is what, what the thin section will show. This is what you see under a microscope. You've got little sticks, you know, and these are sponge spicules. I don't have a scale here, but one little stick like this might be sponge half a millimeter spicules. long. And you can see how thin they are. But extremely well preserved. You see the internal canals. Uh, they're all siliceous. It is pure S <sighs> IO2, like quartz. But uh, I mean, these these. These are not fossils. <laughs> it's actually calcite in a different form of quartz. But that's pretty much all you have in this entire late Permian succession is sponge spicules, right? So everything else had been eradicated. All those calcite secreting organisms, the brachiopods, the bryozoans, the echinoderm, the ammonoid, everything had been... Because it was uh, the... It was caused by an insufficient particle to produce the outcome of a ammonite, I guess, because it was this particle. It wasn't the core of the earth that was supernova or having some major outburst. It was a less substantial particle that was just hanging out on the relatively surface of the earth that uh, sure called the, caused the Siberian traps and caused sponges to be like protrusions, just like little particles flowing that then carve channels that then produce these tubes that are then uh, so solid relative to one another. Like something of that nature, they're not fossils though. Bean eradicated. No wonder they could not find the right fossils to date the rocks. They were just not there. Something bad happened even prior to the late. It, didn't, it just didn't radiate in that direction. Permian extinction. So the environment here is what we call the glass ramp. It's an environment. This is the, the shoreline here, and this is the deep water here. And this is an environment, what we call the carbonate factory, was essentially non-existent. It was gone, right? On the other hand, what we call the silica factory was very productive and this extended way from very shallow water to very deep water, right? All these spicules, all of those sponges were, were happily invading every single ecological niche on that shelf. 
And it's not just the Zverdo Basin. This is the Zverdo Basin here, but it's a phenomenon that we see all along the western margin of what we call Pangaea. Pangaea is the big supercontinent in the late Permian. And I think it's hilarious that we use what's believed to be fossils for geological dating, and we'll find out that they're not fossils, and we'll realize, oh, yeah, that's why they're so well distributed in certain times and able to be used as markers because they're not fossils they're earth processes <laughs> and we have a uh, you know evidence of that shirt all around western canada we've got that's crazy i don't mean of any offense i can see why like i've looked at ammonites before and been like all right <laughs> I didn't challenge it and be like, those aren't fossils. I can see why, without knowing that they're not fossils, that one would think they're fossils, especially in a world that thinks they're fossils. I mean, at that point, it was destined to be. It was, it's not like a... There's no question that they will be considered fossils any time that this type of thing happens. Like a society learns to be able to look at rock and study them, and then they see particles and systems within them in ways that are looking like fossils to the point where they're like fossils, but they're actually not fossils. <clears throat> that here at Banff, for instance, the fantastic church, the Johnson Canyon, and so on and so forth. And uh, in Svalbard, along with western U.S. here, it's an, a, just a, a, a hemispheric phenomenon here. All the, sh the Shelley fossils disappear prior to the late Permian extinction. So the next thing Steve and I did then uh, was to... Shells. Interesting. It's like the... The shell is literally part of this like stability of a particle where the shells become missing when it's supernovas, maybe. So like because there was a large supernova nearby, it cascaded other particles to explode, which were of atom variety, so then like it produces a uh What was I talking about? Deeper water stuff. We went to that section here, which is a key section. It's called Buchanan Lake. And in there, you're deep water, right? You've got deep water shell below, deep water shell above. We have no evidence of an unconformity. This is what it looks like in the field. We measure the section here. Then, then this is the, 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 the boundary right there. And then across here, black stripe formation, blind fjord. It's all shell. It's all mucky. You all get on your knees. You get very dirty when you climb something like this. About no evidence of an unconformity. Like it's, like it's like the supernova like went up to the boundary. So like it went through this boundary and just was able to go this way. But it didn't... Presumably, it didn't make it through the other boundaries, <clears throat> and so it kind of had like a dupe and came this way. Four hundred uh, meters. But also, when in the other direction, it probably hit that like polygon he showed. This one, like it probably came up to the polygon and then started to just meet resistance so it wasn't able to propagate into this polygon as much. It would do some tremendous work. At the boundary, we found a one centimeter layer of pyrite right there. You can see that the, the rusty material seeps down and, and stained the rocks yellow here. Well, that's, that is the event, the catastrophic event that we'll talk about later. Uh, but in that section, it is preserved there. So we did, we ran some stable layer of pyrite right there. You can see that the, the rusty material seeps down and, and stained the rocks yellow here. Well, that's, that is the event, the catastrophic event that we'll talk about later. Uh, but Do 
Just the fact that it seeps down through the layers like that. It just draw everything we think we know is fucking wrong. It's hilarious. But in that section, it is preserved there. So we did, we ran some stable isotopes, carbon isotopes of organic carbon. So this is just a ratio of carbon 13 of carbon 12. Well, they're just different, uh, different so, well, same, uh, same element, but different weight because they have different number of neutrons. That's pretty much all we need to know here. But, we, but you, you see here, there's, they're plotted uh, a lot of samples, 600 samples we, we picked across that cross section here. And interestingly, in the, in the margin here, we, we do know that, that there's a big uh, unconformity. You can see the signal is cut off, right? There's a big kick here. And that kick is not a big event or anything like that. It's just the unconformity. It's just part of the signal is missing because rocks are missing. But when you, you go offshore towards that Buchanan section where there's nothing missing, you can see here that there's no more separation of signal and it's a beautiful continuous signal here. Now one thing you should know, uh, so here's this and there's that here. One thing you should know that the, that Permian Triassic uh, extinction or latest Permian extinction is associated with one. No. monster isotopic shift that's very well recorded around the world. This is Meishan here. You see those data there shifting to the left. Same at Gartner Kofel. That's a core in Austria. Austria, Canada, China. So they're kind of focused around the, the northern Russia, Siberian traps, where that particle is. And here's our Buchanan Lake section. See, that goes just about, just about. Where is Austria exactly? Sorry, to guys. Pardon me. <laughs> exactly. Ah, yes. Well over here. Whoa. Honestly, that's surprising. That's a little far, far west. Well, the same as Gardner for Kofo, it goes down and then kaboom, it, it really, really drops and then it stays low for a while and it comes back. So, so th this was really the, the smoking gun for us. We had the proof that we wanted forever that the succession is continuous Did and the guys kaboom. That's a core in Austria, and here's our Buchanan Lake section. See, that goes just about just about the same as Gardner for Kofel. It goes down and then kaboom, it, it really really drops, and then it stays low for a while, and it comes back. So, so th this and then kaboom, <laughs> literally. Yeah, dude. It was really the, the smoking gun for us. We had the proof that we wanted forever that the succession is continuous and the isotopic record was providing the, this to us. There it is. So that was our first big paper, Steve and I, plus the one on the stratigraphy here. So the <laughs> Filling in the gap. There it is. What we know now is that, yes, there is a big sub triassic unconformity or, or sub blind field unconformity, uh, and it extends quite far into the basin. But if you go into a deeper part of the basin, there's continuous sedimentation and therefore a fabulous Permian Triassic record. So that was the first conclusion that we had here, that the late Permian or early Triassic transition is well preserved in Arctic Canada. So nothing is missing in the deep basin. Sorry, Thor Steinson, sorry, Tozer, you had it wrong. We have it right. This is how it works. And late Permian sediments are fall. Uh, uh, just wait. Wait, so we say nothing is missing in the deep Basin. Didn't he just say leading up to it there is, but there's nothing missing, but at the basin there is? I'm so confused. Fossil poor biogenic church. So don't look for any ammonoids or things that you want to date your rocks with. Uh, it's just not there, except for these tiny little phosphatic condoms, right? The only fossil brown ammonites. Literally date your rocks with ammonites, dudes. You guys are fucking no offense. Just think about how ridiculous that is at some point in your life. Silicious <sighs> unspeculed. 
plus those things we can grab in dissolving the rocks, which are phosphatic. All right? All right, so that takes me to the lead up. Now we're doing, now that we've set the structure, if we, knew, we, we, we know what we're looking at now, now let's talk about the extinction. And the lead up has two big things I want to talk about. One is anoxia. Geologists relying on biology to date. It just shows that it's, it's not biology. It's really that simple. It's not biology. That's why it makes sense. It's, that's why. <laughs> like the fact that you're literally finding that a biology finding is a better method of dating than a geological literally it's because they're geological dudes because one big theory there's no way a biological anything otherwise would be a better source of determining how the earth history is it's absurd about the Permian Triassic extension, which has been going on for about 20 years, is that the, the seawater became uh, depleted in oxygen. And we call that anox. We can't say that in like the time frame when we're talking in billions of years and millions. Maybe we can. That would be surprising if we truly could make that statement he just said. And the lead up has two big things I want to talk about. One is anoxia, because one big theory about the Permian Triassic extension, which has been going on for about 20 years, is that the, the seawater became uh, depleted in oxygen. And we call that anoxia, lack of oxygen, right? And there's various reasons for that. I'll get into that later. But it's a very, very big idea that the uh, fucking fire of the explosiveness, literally the energy just oxidized the shit out of everything. And then there's no oxygen left. Uh, still to survive to this. Burned it. Just burn. It just was an explosive force that ripped through the, uh, through the ocean. And even though it's um, water, it still had... I don't even know if there was oceans, honestly. It was just through the earth in the oceanic crust. Maybe there was a little bit of ocean water in the... But they... There was a lot of it was not was on the continental shelf, still not yet receded into the ocean bed. So I'm not completely sure there was water in the entire ocean in that way, where this would be a thing that would be ocean based. Is they some people are staunchly uh, believer that 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 is the cause of all the extinction in the at least in the ocean that the ocean became anoxic so we steve and i went back to buchanan lake our beautiful section no because none of these things became extinct because they're not fossils as you can imagine and we we measure we sample like here's our isotopes but we sample for other chemical indicators <laughs> get got dudes we also broke our our success no, no offense to people who feel offended to different phases one two three four five six seven in in roman numeral here and uh keeping our eyes on that boundary which is the pyrite you remember the pyrite layer here that's uh, iron sulfide right there you got more iron sulfide higher you've got some carbonates here so what we, we did we just ran a whole bunch of of in, uh, chemical indicators and you don't need to be a geochemist here to to understand what i'm telling you i don't even understand it myself probably steve is the expert here but the key thing here this is our our boundary between the black oh my god so he's allowed to not have to not understand that's how science is like there it's okay to not understand someone else's stuff because that other person's got it as long as we're like agreeing it's like a i'll shake i'll scratch your back you scratch mine kind of thing but then like at some point you realize the person you're relying on not in this instance necessarily is not actually like right <laughs> Back stripe formation and the uh, the overlying blind fjord formation. So, so that is the event. That, That's that is the problem with relying on other people, like we do as a scientific community, where it's literally you take it, like and we just divvy out the work. Here's your assignment. Here's your assignment. The the late LP latest permanent extinction event right there, and you can see. A number of indicators. First of all, this is total sulfur here with those pyrite layers. You can see it increases the boundary and then decreases here. This one is molybdenum uh, on aluminum here. You can see it increases to the boundary and decreases again. This one is nickel, right? And it increases 
decreases. And then finally, chromium, look at that. That's a beautiful trend, as good as a trend you'll ever get in your life. All of these are indicators of anoxia. Because you can only, if you sicker straight those kind of, of, of elements in your rocks if the conditions are. I wonder if they're, I'm going to write them down real quick. Lived in a nickel. without oxygen. So those are dead ringer, especially the pyrite layers there of anoxia. So, so, so far, we seem to be supporting those guys who believe this is the cause of the extinction. Then we, uh, we did the same thing here. Here's the boundary here, and we focus on the essentially 10 or 15 meters below and about 15 to 20 meters above. And you can see all these things, all the indicators, and Steve, in very eloquent uh, way, could explain all these things to you. The key thing here is that we believe that through time, this is a time series here from A to, to, to J here, so A would be a late Permian, starts in the late Permian, here would be early Triassic. A true time, you know, sea level has gone up, but also at, at one point you start developing anoxia in the deep basin, and that anoxia, you know, they started here, and then it got shallower and shallower and shallower, and you reach that peak here right at the, at the extension level, which is right there, and I'm just going to increase that. This is... Whoa, 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 whoa. So they, uh, it started from within... It started from deep within, lower within the earth, the anoxia, like a supernova would probably do, would burn the inner oxygen fuels. From A to, and, and to, like to J here, so A would goes. be a late Permian, starts in the late Permian, here would be early Triassic. A true time, you know, sea level has gone up, but also at, at one point you start developing anoxia. All of this is... This is the supernova of a specific particle over here. So why that would necessarily have an effect over here? I don't know. In the deep basin and that anoxia, you know, they started here and then it got... Probably just changed the state of the earth. Shallower and shallower and shallower and you reach that peak here right at the at the extension level, which is right there, and I'm just going to increase that. This is when the, the, the shelf itself, that is the shallow water area where all those fossils should be living, uh, became under not only anoxic condition, but what we call shallow fossils. Shallow water is where they, like at the boundary. So they formed at the boundary where there was a resistance from the energy flow. that like allowed the spirals and interesting features to kind of coalesce out of the, due to the resistance as the, they were moving in that direction. Like they propagated through it all the energy, but when it faced a resistance, it started to coalesce into formations here. That makes actual sense. That's just an idea, but if there's ammonites like frequently in shallow waters at the edges of boundaries of continental shelf, I would go so far as to say there's, because they're not fossils, there's a physics reason, which is that they're, or geological reason in general, because the boundary, the resistance that they face at, at, as they approach the polygon basically. Euxinic condition, in other words, the, 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 there was so little oxygen in the ocean that now pyrite was precipitating right out of seawater. It was raining down uh, to the bottom floor, and therefore you see that continuous pyrite layer. There's very few places in the world where we see that right now. One is the Black Sea, where the Black Sea is very stratified, about 200 meters below the surface. You get into very anoxic water and even euxinic water, and pyrite rains down to the bottom. So, so far, so good. Now, then we took another step with a, a, a fellow uh, geochemist from Germany, Joachim Nies, and this time we look at the, the stabilized level of nitrogen. So again, very complicated diagrams. Don't worry about them. Myself, I don't understand them all. A couple of things here. One is what we call a lycopane here. It's a, it's a biomarker, and then all kinds of indicators of, uh, of you know, anoxia or various things. And so we looked at, at this here. This is the isotopes here, the carbon to nitrogen ratio. Very important. So you can see trends here, declines as you, as you go up. And then here we sulfur. compare. Big spike in sulfur. Those trends here with.
which is definitely related to volcanoes type of thing, which would probably be related to just generally like a supernova of a particle also. Meishan, this is Meishan here in China, that, that global stratotype, and our stuff here. And our stuff is much different than Meishan. It's, it's much lower, and uh, so we were able to actually demonstrate uh, that, um, um, it, that, sorry, that boundary, you know, what we call the redox boundary uh, that occurs here was actually substantially deeper than we thought. This, this guy, uh, Knies in, in Germany, uh, told us, uh, no, it's, it's actually, it was actually below the photic zone, the, the zone of light penetration, which means at the top of this here was a good 100 meters below water. So again, it kind of put uh, some, uh, <clears throat> some doubt into that model that says that anoxic uh, water just, just killed uh, everything at the end permian. Uh, we, we, we seem to have here geochemical evidence that there was actually oxic mm -hmm. conditions somewhere on the shelf, not in those sections, but somewhere on the shelf. So then we went on to find those areas where it would have been oxic, and we found one section. It's called Blind Fjord, West Blind Fjord here. And this is a, a paper that is cur currently being reviewed, but we use another type of isotope. Oh, it really is a boundary of anoxia. Oops. molybdenum, and you can see here the red dots are all Buchanan Lake, whereas those uh, uh, yellow... Rock phasing with black shales and graphitic sediments of various kinds. Those squares are from Blind Fjord, and they tell you Blind Fjord was oxic while the rest was anoxic. Right, so, so here we have very good evidence, and we were forced now to change our model a bit, and this time we realized we had an oxygen minimum zone. So oh there was oxic water at the bottom, but also at the top, and that, uh, as I said, the top of the... Wait, where is this? Where is, is this? Is this here? of that zone was about 100 meters deep, which means that some large areas were under oxic conditions. So if the large area of shallow water were under oxic condition, therefore, you cannot invoke anoxia as the cause of the extension. It's probably a contributing factor, but not the cause. So... <sighs> You cannot invoke anoxia as the cause of the extension. It's probably a contributing factor, but not the cause. So here is some summary of that, that geochemical work. The late Permian deep to shallow buildup of anoxic waters and latest Permian euxenic conditions in the Zverda Basin that led to the you know, precipitation of pyrites in seawater very bad. Late Permian deep to shallow buildup of anoxic waters. Oxygen depleted waters and latest Permian euxinic conditions. Pyrite precip precipitates out of seawater. Oh, I see. In Sverdrup. Anoxia and euxinia, euxinia occurred in oxygen minimum zone below photic zone. As in where the sunlight reaches, maybe, even though like, <laughs> not fossils. Bad conditions. However, we know that anoxia and euxina occur in, in an oxygen minimum zone below the photic zone, below the zone of light penetration. So that's below 100 meters. So this means that large areas of the shelf remain oxic. Therefore, good for life, right? All right. So the other lead up that we had is ocean acidification, right? You, you've heard about ocean edification because we hear about it in the modern world, and I'll tell you about that in a second. So we went back here to, the, to our succession, and starting in the late Carboniferous, that's Pennsylvania, that's, that's tens of million years before that early Permian. Uh, that I'm just thinking like how, how a lot of my research is probably going to come in this format at this stage. I don't give a shit anymore. Like, I went to write a paper about Himalayas, and I'm like, fuck y'all. <laughs> I don't even feel like it. Like, that's how I feel. This is, this is way easier. I know people, like, the reason I would write a paper type of format is just for ease and benefit of others. So that would make it easier. And, like, 
also for more of like a scientific reasoning and just to make it but like at this point i really think i should just start talking and watching videos and reacting basically and presenting my own line of reasoning as as i go and literally just do it that way never even fucking write another paper like that just be doing reaction videos where i'm like here's how things work at the permanent triassic extension we had that very prolific and watch me find it out in front of your face so you can find it out see how i recorded it all knowing that i was like that's what happens i found the theory of everything it's not like i didn't know so then i'm like i guess i can record shit <laughs> Perfect carbonate factory around that all of that blue stuff here is just two kilometers of carbonate so rich in fossils there's not a rock uh, that does not contain fossil algae corals um uh, uh and fossils so it's like uh, the uh subtle layer surrounding a more dense system in some way i don't know Brachiopods, you name it, you know. Like little little galaxies. That's that's why I said that. Like little galaxies surrounding the more substantial system here that weren't able to like get into the system as much. All kinds of dazzling clad algae, green algae, red algae, just unbelievable. It's so rich, and it's huge, right? And here's a good example here. We've got all these these shelf cycles here, going through these massive shelf. This is such bullshit, dudes. You guys are literally just cheating. Like, this is not absolutely a fossil. You can't fucking say that. We just got biologists jumping in. Oh, that's a fossil. Geologists like, all right. <laughs> and then they start saying it. It's literally not a fossil at all. It's the same as this. If some, If this object which is not a fossil, looks like a tree, but is not. If this object were to be small, there would be literally no debate whatsoever. It would be called a fossil. It's real simple. They're not fossils. Carbonate reefs, right? They're you just so small that we can't tell the difference. You see, did, what, you're looking at about a six or and some of them so shaped like fossils because they're natural processes that we can't tell the difference. 700 kilometers of uh, seven meters of rocks here. It's just a, a, an amazing carbonate factory, and this is what you see in tin section. All these fossils here, you know, this this is this is incredibly rich, as rich as anywhere else in the world for that time. And Cyclic shelf carbonates. Oh my. God, it's like a particle was there and it's supernova or like it had a ring around it at least that was shelf carbonates in, in a circle type of shaper, shaper, and whatever's going on here, have to see that better. But the, by the late Permian, we still have a shallow shelf, but as you know now, that shallow shelf was, was churred, was, it was sponge spicules. And nothing but these tiny little sticks. What a change. Think about it. You went from... Okay, so that, that makes sense, though. That the uh, supernova, the particle, over here, maybe filled in surrounding region with uh, little, little thingamajigs, these things. This to that, right? If that doesn't wreak... Environmental devastation. I wonder what. Wait, let me go back. This. For shallow. Sh it went from this where it was shirt. Shelf, but as you know now, that shallow shelf was was shirt. Was it was sponge spicules, and nothing but these tiny little sticks. What a change! Think oh. about it. You went from this. I don't know what. Carbonate to this to that to shirt. Uh, 
this to that, right? If that like that, just a higher density of the, the little systems doesn't wreak environmental devastation. I wonder what would, right? It, it, I'm not sure because it's exactly the same environment shallow shelf as the previous one, but it's just one that no longer was able to support calcite carbonate secreting organisms. So how do you explain that, right? Well, it's something that- oh, Late Permian it was no longer able to. That's pretty easy because the supernova was basically done. I've been working on ever since my PhD and uh, for many years I've been interpreting this as resulting from, from a cooler trend in, in this vertebrae basin, from going from very warm to very cold. This part but of that the supernova. ID, that juvenile ID I had just doesn't hold anymore because we knew at that time it was <laughs> don't mind me just answering the question saying that's pretty easy and then him saying i've been working on this my whole career don't mind that how that goes global warming the, the evidence is, is is everywhere around the world it was global warming just think there were big glaciations in in southern pangea we call Gonwada. In, in, uh, in the early part of this, and at the end, there were coal measures in Australia. You know, the coal, the coal industry in Australia was very highlighted, like 80 degrees south, but there were forests there. Same in, in uh, Siberia. So the world was getting warmer, so we cannot invoke cooling of, 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 uh, of the world. So we've come up with another alternative, which is ocean acidification. And you know that right now we're pumping CO2 like crazy, driving our cars and everything. And as we pump CO2 in the atmosphere, it goes into the ocean, transforms itself into carbonic acid, which is the oh my god, the acid you have in your Coke or your, your pop, which itself breaks down into a number of components, bicarbonate, carbonate, but most importantly, hydrogen. And the more hydrogen you have, of course, the lower your pH, and therefore, the lower... They pretty much invoke, let's say, that they, these creatures like kind of live up in the water above and just kind of die and drop their shells down and compile one on top of another when the energy flows are really actually going sideways through them like this and then creating a spiral and that's it it's really that simple it's this is not happening where you're uh yeah, higher your, your acidity and 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 carbonates and acid uh Water. Maybe there's some of this type of stuff going on in some way, but like, certainly not the overall. Don't work well together, they dissolve carbonates, right? It's well known that this acid material will dissolve carbonate, and therefore you have a, a rise. Of it's well known that the truth will dissolve untruth, falsehood, misinterpretation. So what we call the saturation or rise. Substance will fill voids. So which is called lysocline. And we're seeing this right now in our very world before our very eyes. Uh, this is a big, big problem. In my opinion, uh, the biggest problem with, with our, our climate change issue is not that much what's happening in the land, it's what's happening in the ocean. And if we're not very careful, we're going to kill literally the ocean, certainly kill all its carbonate secreting organisms. But that's for another talk. But anyway, uh, well, you know, there's the reefs. But also these little guys, these are cocolid, there's also pteropods, those... It's so funny how reliant on biology it is when it's not even biology because it's not biology and that's why it's reliable. In the modern world, a very, very important component of the biological <laughs> pump, the sequestrate carbonate at the surface and, and dump it deep in the ocean. The day we cannot precipitate these little guys, we're going to be in deep trouble and the global warming will accelerate very quickly. Uh, but not to worry, I'm not going to talk about this today, but using those kind of ideas, we say, well, can we apply this to the distant past, to the, to the late Permian? Yes, I know that recent more, like this might actually be a present image of this, a reef, oh, reef microscope. Not just a fossilized one, but a living one. Almost in, in, in inevitably the things that we see as uh, not fossils, they're really not fossils, I know, are still fossils, and I, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, but like that there's a 
there is an angle where they're stable during the change and then essentially they freeze from the cool like they they were stable in a in in a supernova environment because they were just stable in that environment period like that it was as if the earth were to constant like a, the sun let's say were to have just permanently the same conditions as the earth had and then have uh living like coral reef and things form that was literally from a different dimension and because time was uh not the the way these observers these coral reefs experience time is so uh, stretched out that it appears like fine temperature wise like it's highly likely that that's actually why they look so similar is that it is this cross-dimensional thing going on but uh at that point i know i lose a lot of the audience not that i have any audience at this stage although maybe soon I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. it's just it's real soon, dudes. I feel the imminence of me breaking through a fucking barrier. To the late Permian. So we came up with a model. Uh, again, this is a time series here where you've got that boundary here. It's called the lysocline, which is really the limit of calcite <clears throat> saturation. And then you calcite compensation depth which is a bit like the snow line against a, a mountain here in the foothills or the front range here. And it's really the boundary below which all calcium carbonate organisms or, or precipitate or whatever will be dissolved. So below the CCD, you've got no carbonate at all. So we got... Uh, okay. I'm going to pause here. Let's go outside. I'm going to be outside. You guys can move forward. I'm not going to stop recording. You can move forward if you feel so inclined. Probably like 15 minutes or just, you know, you know do, do this kind of thing. With, oh, you can't see. Yeah, like this kind of thing. And find where I get rid of that image of the backyard. Because I'm going to be back there smoking. So, here we go hide though off screen but i mean i'll just put it there for laws why not just a little something in the meantime okay
Okay, let me turn that off. Cool. We got a time series here from the, the Pennsylvania all the way to the Permian Triassic <laughs> boundary right there, where you judge me. Actually, not to tell you to, but you're gonna anyway. You know, inc raise your lysocline width through time. And by the late Permian, the lysocline was very, very high. That calcite compensation death was right uh, above the shelf. Therefore, nothing you know, could, could, could build skeleton there. And if one was lucky enough to build one, it would be immediately dissolved anyway uh, in that kind of very acid soup. So that is the model here. And just to take you quickly to the... Let me go back where this started right there. We say, well, can we apply this to the distant past, to the, to the late Permian? So we came up with a model. Uh, again, this is a time series here where you've got that boundary. They're using too many wordians that I don't know in age. Oh, dear God. It's so precise. Why not just put some numbers, guys, at least. It's easier with numbers, even if I don't agree with the numbers. Where was it? Oh. Um, Paleozoic. Phanerozoic. I'm trying to get this further broken down. Mesozoic. Uh, I think that wordian. Nope, nope. <laughs> Permian. So. It's the end here. If I go to Permian. Okay, here we go. So this is, let me just pull it out there. Moscovian. Even that's not visible. Oh my god. It's so precise. <laughs> Wait. It's so exact. It's like within this one even. Oh my god. It doesn't it doesn't go down further here. Whatever. Maybe I'll just go okay, E was it was at uh two sixty seven. So if we go to F I can't really read that. Let's say Acelian. B, so before B, okay, so start beginning and okay. Okay, starting around the beginning of the Permian and ending probably at the end of the Permian. And Andunian age? Andunian? It literally didn't even come up with something. I think that's I N D U A N. Okay, the Wichita one or whatever. <laughs> ah, I was hoping that would just kind of let me see it. Ah, okay. It is two fifty four and ends two fifty four. So yeah, this is the end of the Permian. Full Permian. Okay. All right. With that in mind. We say, well, can we apply this to the distant past, to the, to the late Permian? So we came up with a model. Uh, again, this is a time series here where you've got that boundary here. It's called the lysocline, which is really the limit of calcite saturation. And then uh, I wish I could see this better. <sighs> Damn. It's hard. I can't. Uh, illegible. Shelf carbonate. Like, if I don't just know the word, I can't read it, essentially. F photo. I'm not sure what they're saying there. Carbonate. Something carbonate. <clears throat> well, based on the... It's essentially, this is carbonate. This is a... 
slope carbonate basin. Oh, so this is this is the basin. Outer, mid, inner shelf ramp. So the inner ramp. So this must lead up to And your calcite compensation depth. I'm just trying to get a direction, which direction the supernova thing is generally coming from and what they're talking about here. Let's go ahead and start this one more time. This is a time series here where you've got that boundary here. It's called the lysocline, which is really the limit of calcite saturation. And then your calcite compensation depth. Which the limit of what concentration? Calcite? Calcium. And then you calcite. Really, the limit of calcite saturation. And then you calcite saturation. Okay. Lyso. Climb. Limit. Calcite. Saturation. Oh my god. It's like, why does that work? I said saturation. <laughs> um, so uh, while I was writing that, I was thinking. It's kind of like there's a, a radius of a sphere, like calcite, let's say. <coughs> the overlapping spheres one of the spheres is calcite and it at certain times in the earth's expansion process when the supernova occurred it started with a low a low calcite basically this is like the 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 influx of the supernova maybe but that i don't think that happened until here of the Permian uh, Triassic boundary particle here. This did not happen until presumably, although maybe it was starting, like there was a, there was a buildup maybe that for some reason was in the direction opposite to where the energy ended up propagating producing like a high concentration of almost like when water pushes uh, sand and piles up sand to a point where it like is able to deflect in a direction like maybe the energy propagation through the earth. I I know I'm just spitballing here, guys. It's okay. <laughs> the propagation of energy this way that came to the end of the fracturing, and the energy began to be absorbed in here. Maybe it was like producing like a separation kind of like here let's see if there's any suggestion like this separation maybe anything that flowed this way flowed into it but anything that managed to get past here this looks almost like an ammonite right there It spirals in like it spirals in clockwise inward, and then anything that made it past that over this way maybe was <clears throat> was dividing sort of like how the particle here sent this ripple down here and then it, it reached this point of separation where half of them separated this way 
and the other half separated this way, <clears throat> like they were running into resistance from, I guess, just here. And um, so maybe in the same way, like the energy that propagated into the particle had a, an opposing energy that propagated away from and into the Arctic region while it was feeding into the particle that was producing like a imbalance of this calcite concentration, calcite depth, to basically increase the depth of the calcite up to a higher level so that it was just permeating through a, it was just more present so it basically was a larger mound of calcite that was temporary while the like energy was propagating uh, into the particle while it was coming down here and then this particle was getting fed until it's supernova and like there was a balance in some way that then stopped the fueling of the um, carbonates, calcite, the calcite. I think that makes that makes pretty good sense to me. From what I know, I know people hearing me and who are like realizing I exist and like <gasps> and reacting and like immediately hearing like two words like ah that thing he said I can't ex I can't believe he said that <laughs> I understand that side of things but I'm just gonna go ahead and just behave like I like this is my okay this is my opinion let's just acknowledge that of course it's my opinion. And of course it changes across time because I'm malleable, I'm open-minded. To a degree, obviously, there's things that I'm probably not allowing into my being out of and resisting. <clears throat> Definitely, let's say. But, like, <laughs> I'm trying. I don't think you guys are trying. I don't see anyone out there trying to put the pieces together. I see them trying to separate the pieces into smaller pieces. Calcite compensation depth, which is a bit Although like... Although then again, maybe I'm doing that in my own way by trying to make us all have like identities almost. Like we all deserve to have our, like the infinite life that each individual can have. <clears throat> Rather than like an all is one and selfless, totally selfless for the all and nothing else. Like willing to sacrifice self utterly. Just total enslavement to like, yes, I'm willing to be uh, vaccinated and all these things. Just to be, just fucking yes sir, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir, dead. Okay, I hope I did my part. Kind of approach, which maybe is better. But I, in my opinion... Uh, requires a uh, functional seed that doesn't lead to chaos. Maybe that's a good way to put it. Like, we got this non-crystalline, kind of, like, just conglomerate, like, a, of a government, let's say, that, like, this is how we're doing things here here it is, and then it's like a seed that things spawn off of, and like depending on how good it's formed, it sometimes it spawns really well and creates like a really nice orderly spiral. <clears throat> and other times it just leads to this. It just like gets out of hand like this, like where it, it like loses its stability. Let's go here, 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 here. Spiral, spiral loses its stability. It even starts to separate the energy flows. These are only here because they're part of, this is why this fossil is amazing. Or rock. <laughs> I just allow it being called a fossil when I say fossil. It's not that I think it's a fossil. <laughs> 
Although maybe I'm open to it being a fossil. I'm open to it still being a fossil, okay? And in like a cooler way, as long as you guys are open to it being a fossil in a cooler way, then we can maybe meet an accord where it's like a across dimensions when the like it's like a moment in time when the stability of the system was what these systems were stable in because it was such a high energy environment but it was a supernova so we just like crossed dimensions and like s splashed over into ours and then it crossed back into their own dimension and we all we just have imprints of their like unstable uh unstable moment in time where the like like the fabrics of the dimensions actually were able not just to be layers but to be mount like a like the Himalayas to come out through the layer from a different layer below through it and to be exposed on the surface of the next layer this maybe is that kind of thing in that way it could be a fossil but not like traditional sense okay so this fossil it shows the instability though which it's like it it's hard to get bigger that's the thing <laughs> the bigger it gets the the more it needs a stable like seed to have actually been the point of origin <clears throat> so if we have like the that's what like the united states did it really did produce a good seed like the the founding fathers kind of idea of the constitution and the uh, the amendments bill of rights and the declaration of independence like they they produced a sound crystalline seed that was a kernel or a, a basis upon which the future formed around accreted on and then over time, we kind of <laughs> divided into two-party system. Maybe that's a good way to put it, even. And then the two-party systems is starting to divide as well into like individual pockets. So that there's just a, a huge divide of what was once a single unified system has become just chaos. Because the seed... I mean, as good as it was, wasn't really based in truth. Like, like uh, the truth is, <laughs> there shouldn't be a government. That all is one, and we should just work together and acknowledge one another as parts of this society and try to figure out how to be at peace and like share what is all of ours with all of ours all of us like allow free flow of everything really <sighs> but like also the seed was in this instance the seed is composed of a of a less dense material, more porous, more more like disorder in the structure, basically. It's just, it's not as crystalline. Whereas a shallygram is, it's one unit. It does not have the same like ammonite. And it exposes the the inner workings of the universe. It really opens things up so we can see inside. Which is like what the true seed of like the most subtle seed can really produce. In a way, because this is kind of like an ether-based flow that is then causing particles that exist within a matrix a, a, like a conglomerate particle but more stable in a more dense setting the ether flow 
causes the the particle to interact with it and and literally bend the ether flow into its into its orbit in essence and start to carve into the surroundings while the particle probably is physically changing in radius expanding also changing in radius in like sequences like dick like a uh, nuclear fusion kind of thing where there's like a sudden outburst of emissions to a point where it literally produces the remnants of a supernova on in a rock. I mean, this is out... Of was I saying about ammonites? So maybe like the, it requires a good enough seed. Like we, we kind of produced a, an ammonite seed in the United States where it is able to produce a detectable nucleus and spiral that is the United States. And then also is people like myself who are not really like as gung ho and within the like at the nucleus but are like part of the system and are literally separate separate from outside systems in a way where it's like the these again where like the United States is maybe one of these maybe a big one occupies a lot of space, pushes on its surroundings, really causes, shapes its surroundings based on it. And so when it's, it is becoming a chaotic spiral itself and starting to like divide into separate, smaller, stable particles, it, uh, becomes like so we gotta like figure out the seed first which is pretty much that all is one i believe all is one is the seed so that's it's like and zero like everything from nothing is not the seed like that is the seed to chaos there's like a bar a bar galaxy which is probably more stable. It's just I I haven't like investigated this line of this thought, but it's just something that I'm just as soon as it occurred to me, I was like, probably makes sense that like one and zero, like the universe is based on ones and zeros, <laughs> and there's bar galaxies that kind of have a one at the center, and then there's things like 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 let me look at storms, hurricane images maybe. Counterclockwise, counterclockwise. I don't know if I can find the image. Some of them really look like they have no nucleus and just really spiral in. But the, even here, this kind of, the eye, it's kind of like a zero. So there's probably like two fundamental differences of a of a of a seed of a of a zero or a seed of a one. And all is one is like a seed of oneness which is the one to produce stability and like that that ascend the concept that it, everything gets larger and larger and everything gets smaller and smaller larger and larger systems are composed of smaller and smaller systems to a point where if you just keep going down the down the line somewhere you reach a point of such subtlety that it approaches nothingness so really in a way nothing is the seed of the universe false <laughs> that is a thing i've said and I'm, I'm really like i think it's chaos and maybe it's i am uh probably 
wrong in in like profound ways like that that where zero is not actually the basis of the universe because that that drives things towards actual nothingness like towards utter destruction to a point where there really is nothingness all right then here you go <laughs> whereas all is one real and one is all really provides a balance that all is one so there's the balance at the center and then there's the one is all the rotating like let me get a bar a bar galaxy like this all is one one is all kind of thing like that that is a seed is probably the most stable of a way to form anything some sort of bar and then a rotation from there <clears throat> why would that be and it's really <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to hate on nothing because it really is like it, I'm immediately thinking about this. Why is there a bar? <laughs> like what's a why is it, there's a rotating bar? That's kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know if I've investigated this much to actually have some conclusions on what's like what to think of it in in view of what I was just talking about all of this. <clears throat> but I'm just in my head thinking about people judging me as I'm as I display any like inadequacy, any gap in my understanding. Oh, look, there's a gap. Therefore, it must mean everything he said is false. It's really just like the things from the other uh, models have not just have other observations that are known have have been incorporated into other models and maybe not actually validly but at least are there in the other models to a point where they're like what if we got this explained <laughs> and i'm like ah well you know i haven't i'm literally not exposed to everything but the thing is i discovered the the theory of everything by finding how magnetic fields are caused by gravity and how all distant redshifted galaxies are caused by gravity so i'm like you guys actually are a little like missing that i know what i'm talking about and so let's go back to the <laughs> let's go on like the snow line on. against a, a mountain uh, here in the foothills or <laughs> the Damn, front I'm range only, here i'm only 20 i still got 25 minutes to go at 223 or 222 yeah and, and it's really the boundary below which all calcium carbonate Okay, so yeah, back to this. The calcite is pro is probably related to like a build up. I haven't eaten yet. It's, I haven't eaten yet. I should I, maybe I should just stop. I was like, fuck it, I'll finish in one recording. Fuck it. Just make it one recording then. <laughs> uh, organisms or, or precipitate or whatever will be dissolved. So below the C C D you've got no carbonate at all. So we got a time series. Okay, so we got carbonate. Okay. here from the, the Pennsylvania all the way to the Permian Tract. Oh, I see. So there's some materials here <clears throat> that probably are related, related to the ether flow in general, maybe, if they're new. I don't know if they're how, how old these materials are that are the carbonate base that, is, that will be transformed by this uh, saturation through... Uh, the layer of the calcite and then it recedes classic boundary right there where you actually you know in raise your lysocline with through time and by the late permian the lysocline was very very high that calcite nice. compensation this is good good study and that was right above the shelf therefore nothing you know, could, could, could build skeleton there. And if one was lucky enough to build one, it would be immediately dissolved anyway uh, in that kind of very acid soup. So that is the model here. And just to take you quickly to the, some of them here, this is Pennsylvania here. So you can see the, the lysocline is very low. And then, and then it starts rising in the earliest Permian here. And then by Congorian time, it's quite hot. 
There's the words. Maybe I should go to the first one. This is almost worth a little later. Uh, in that kind of very acid soup. So that is the model. Hand drawing these and writing this in my notebook almost. It's a lot of information in these slides. Super saturated, under saturated. Oh, I see. Oh, so some other saturation pushed it upwards. So it's not that the saturation is going upwards, it's some other thing is going upwards and pushing the boundary that's influencing this upwards, I think. Super saturated, under saturated. Well, here. And just to take you quickly to the sum of them here, this is Pennsylvania here, so you can see the, the lysocline is very low, and then, and then it starts rising in the earliest Permian here, and then by congruent time, it's quite high, and you can see here, you're starting to get that, that, uh, that uh, shallow chert here, that white colored chert, but you still have carbonates here. But at the time, this is the, the late Permian. By the time you get to the late Permian, no more carbonates. The whole thing is gone, and it was very acid environment. <clears throat> so it kind of did the same thing that got that occurred to the Himalayas of like a metamorphosis, maybe, just on a different scale where we saw it from a different angle. Uh, now there are actually I lied. There's, there are a few. I love like. <laughs> this is this is unfair of science to do. <clears throat> when we see a shape and then we we like CGI it into being a, at at this point it is this but really it, it's only always been this rare fossils associated with that chert and but they are phosphatic nature and one of them is called lingula. This is a brachiopod, inarticulate brachiopod. You can see it right there. The bluish color tells you it's phosphate, not calcium carbonate. This guy is still living. It's the oldest living fossil that we have. It's still living in the ocean. It's the most resilient organic. Oh my God. Now that's cool. Going back to the fossils that's <clears throat> resonate i mean maybe it like vibrated into an equilibrium actually <clears throat> so it wasn't that they weren't state that they were only stable then and that, like there was i was kind of in that what i was saying earlier was almost assuming that it would return to a previous equilibrium but maybe it was vibrating towards a new equilibrium that it was approaching in some ways <clears throat> Because we did like change our energy state, I'm pretty sure. <clears throat> that exists, and uh, no surprise it could. Like we probably even changed in a way where we're not quite the same beings. Would live in acidic, hard conditions because first of all, it builds a skeleton out of. At that point. Phosphate, but also we do live pretty short lives to a, to a point where that. <laughs> We never lived that long. <laughs> so it digs little hole, and it can kind of create its own micro environment, and it's still well, around. They said, well, "Who cares what they said? Who cares about the long line of people who have passed it on, making it more clear that it is in fact an ancestral narrative? Who cares?" <laughs> Obviously, they, it didn't happen. Down with us. Not very common, but it's there. And it's an amazing beast. It's been there for over 500 million years. Okay, I am too hungry. I'll be back. I'll, I still got enough to make a substantial part two. So I'll be back.